welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Normally on this show, I analyze the techniques of a certain artist or writer, or I look at an interesting piece of comic book history. Today, I'm going to be doing something a little different. I'm going to talk to you about superheroes, but I'm not talking about comic books. Why am I doing this? Real quick, uh, my supporters on Patreon voted for me to cover a certain creator, and that episode is going to take more than one week to put together. It's just a little more complex, intricate, and longer than a typical episode. It's going to take me two weeks. I should have it ready next week. But I wanted to have some content for you. So, there's something I've always sort of had in my back pocket that I've intended to talk about on this channel, and that is the fact that for about a year, uh, maybe a little longer, I was a superhero, um, usually called a real-life superhero. It's a very weird time in my life, um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about it, because this is definitely not something everybody out there does. Um, why did I do it? Let me get into it. Uh, and just so you know, this is designed to be an easy episode for me to make, so there's not going to be a lot of edits here. I'm talking without a script. I've just got some notes about what I want to address. So it's going to be a little more casual than a lot of episodes. I'm going to mix in a little bit of footage, but not a ton. It's mostly just going to be me talking to you. But this is a weird topic, so I think that people will be interested. I hope you will be interested. There have been real-life superheroes for a long time, uh, people that dress up in costume and try to patrol uh, their city or maybe at least do some sort of outreach. Um, and there are documentaries out there that can talk to you about the history. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to tell my specific story. I'm also not here to give any real gossip on other real-life superheroes because I partnered with I would argue the most famous one, uh, Phoenix Jones. How did I meet him? Well, uh, before I lived in the same city as him, I used to write for a website. It's now defunct, but it was called The Robot's Pajamas, and uh, I would write all sorts of articles there, uh, sometimes about comic books, like stuff that I do these days, but um, also about anything nerd culture. And I was fascinated with the fact that there was this guy dressing up in a costume out there fighting crime. He had been in the news. He had a super suit. He seems to have a martial arts background. I was fascinated by that. And um, my fiance's family lives out in Seattle where Phoenix Jones operates. So one time when I was visiting, I was able to connect with him. I went out on a patrol with him and another of his superheroes at the time, a guy named El Caballero. He basically wore a big Mexican sombrero, and um, and I interviewed him along with going out with them on an actual patrol. And it was pretty exciting because you know I saw him uh, confront you know drunk people, people that were looking to start fights. Saw him you know administer administer some basic first aid, confront some uh, apparent drug dealers that were. You know, that was a little scary. Um, I was out there in a bulletproof vest that he provided me. But it was interesting. It was very interesting. I wrote, like, an article, and that was that. And then, uh, life happened. I ended up getting a great job opportunity in Seattle. At the time, I was living in D.C. So, um, it was a good opportunity. As I said, my, my I've got family out here, basically, through my fiancé, and we moved across the country. And I didn't know anybody out here, socially except for Phoenix. And I'd stayed in touch. He knew that I was an artist. He was talking to me about, like, you know, making a comic book. He was doing a speaking engagement at, like, Nike, and he had me design a shoe that they were going to produce for him at one time. At least these were things that I was told. N none of them really came to fruition, but at the time I didn't know. And I was enamored. I was like, wow, a celebrity, blah, blah, blah. Because I didn't really know anybody out here, I was hanging out with him, um, and uh, and he was kind to me, and he's a big personality. We, no matter what you can say about him, uh, big personality, and very charming. And I decided, well, maybe I could do this with him. Maybe. 
Maybe I can make a difference. That's a stretch, right? Well, let me tell you where I was at the time. Uh, I had been studying Krav Maga for a number of years. Um, so I felt like I was pretty good in a, in a fight if I needed to be. And for the two years before I moved out here, I had been working out a lot. I was in much different shape than you see me now. Uh, I used to do the insanity workout every day, Monday through Friday, at my company's gym for my hour lunch break, every single day for two, two years. And every other night, I would go see a personal trainer at the gym for another hour or so. A lot of working out. So I was in good shape. I was studying a martial system of fighting. And I was like, well, maybe I could do this. You know, maybe. Uh, it seems bizarre and, and kind of ridiculous, right? But, but Phoenix had a plan, which I had seen in person when I interviewed him. You know, you had to wear a bulletproof vest. Okay, that made sense. Uh, you had to either be military, police, or have a bunch of martial arts training. Those are the only people he would take out with him. At least that's what he told me. Okay. And, you know... He would go out with a, a small team and everybody would have a task. Uh, one person was responsible for calling 911 when necessary. One person was the team medic and had supplies for that. Um, there was the sort of point man and then like a second person to back him up so that like he didn't get hit behind the head or something like that. Okay. It, it seemed to make sense. So the first time I went out was um, New Year's. New Year's night, turning 2014. And... I had a bit of success and it was exciting. A lot of people out that night, you know, it's New Year's. We, um, we primarily patrolled in Capitol Hill in Seattle, which has a lot of clubs and uh, can get pretty rowdy when those clubs get let out. Anyway, um, among the people that we would bump into, cause you know, you're wearing costumes, so you make, you get noticed. And, and that's sort of the point to draw the attention. I, at that point, was just wearing a hoodie and a ski mask. Not much of a costume. But we bumped into a guy who looked very distraught, and he came up and he was like, hey, can you help me? I have called the police already, but um, my girlfriend that I came here with, we've, we've gotten separated, we, we don't have cell phones, or she doesn't, she didn't have the cell phone. He had a cell phone, but she didn't. I can't find her, we've been separated. And on top of that, she speaks uh, Spanish, but not English. Oh, well, uh, what's she look like? Okay, uh-huh. Got a description. I made a very clear mental note of that. Got this guy's cell phone. Several hours later, I actually saw a woman that matched this guy's description in a subway shop, and I speak, uh, un poquito espanol. I speak enough. I took it in college. And I went inside and talked to her. I was like, you know, are you, you, you aren't uh, looking for your boyfriend or something, are you? And she's like, she got so excited. She was like, oh my God. You know, like, yes, yes, yes. I, I don't know this. I don't know this city. I don't know where I am. I can't get a hold of him. I've just been like staying at this restaurant until like, hopefully we can reconnect. I go, you know what? You're in luck. Let me call him. I called the guy. He answered. I was like, I found her. Come to the subway on this street. Like, you know, it was like a few blocks away, essentially. And he was so excited. And uh, it made me feel good. I was like, okay, you know, I just did something. Um, it wasn't like, you know, swinging in in a rope and punching out somebody. But, you know, I saw Phoenix and some of the guys, you know, when I was with them, like, you know, sort of separate some people from fights. So that was just kind of exciting, too. But I felt like, you know what, maybe I can do something. That was a really, I mean, the fact that I actually accomplished something on my first night out that I specifically like noti noticed this lady and was communicating, I, it made me feel good. So I built a superhero suit. I, I bought myself uh, a really pricey bulletproof vest. Um, they come in different levels. The one I got was called, I believe, level three. 3A, I could be slightly mistaken that, but what it was was beyond being bulletproof, it's um, stab and needle proof. The, the, the material will literally harden as it's hit by something very small. So if somebody came at me with a knife, I'd probably also be protected. It would just protect, you know, your chest, but that's fine. And I got myself a um, 
motorcycle jacket that had plates of armor essentially like very loose but you know enough for like if you fall down from from that and I colored some areas red and I spray painted like an Omega symbol on it and I named myself Omega I also got an airsoft um, mask an airsoft mask uh, those are the, the main components and so so I had my superhero suit and I called myself Omega and I met a bunch of the rest of his team and some of them were really great people. Um, there was one guy I really respected called uh, Evocatus, and uh, he was former military. Uh, he seemed smart and very kind, very tall, uh, in good shape. There was uh, a lady named Girl Scout, and she uh, had more of like a filmmaking background, I believe, and had like maybe been doing a documentary on Phoenix. There were always like these like projects that sort of fell apart that were going to be like a TV show or a documentary based on Phoenix. Always. And, uh, but I think that that's how she had met him. But she was also like a very kind and very smart person. So I respected both of them quite a bit. And there were some other um, people that were like, you know, people Phoenix knew. People would come and go to. There were a lot of superhero turnover. There was one guy named Boomer who really wanted to be an EMT. Um, I don't know, maybe he's become an EMT by now, but he, that was his goal. He wanted to, he always wanted to be the team medic. He was really into that. Phoenix didn't really like that guy, actually. Um, there was a guy named Midnight Jack. That was a guy that I did not, I, I, I came to not respect him because that guy always had weapons on him. Uh, or or wanted to take out weapons and like literally Phoenix was the one that would be telling him like no you cannot take a knife out that or you cannot take like weapons like this because that shows intent and it was very important to, to Phoenix that like you know we did not carry weapons because we were wearing masks made sense he talked to a lawyer I don't know how much of the advice he got was was good or not but it seemed like it made sense at the time you know, I was new to all of this. Um, and there were a couple other guys that, like, you know, had various backgrounds, and some of them were goofballs. It was, it was, it was entertaining, though. So um, we began, or I began, joining them uh, regularly for these patrols in downtown Seattle. And that usually started, you know, at the earliest, like, 11 p.m. But we'd be out to, like, 3 or 4 sometimes a.m. Um, in Capitol Hill there was an area that we called Glass Alley because cars were just constantly broken into and every once in a while we'd be lucky enough to catch a guy that was about to break into a car and either chase him off or sort of like you know just follow him and have the police show up and arrest him. Uh, we're heading to an area that we call Glass Alley we call it that because cars are constantly getting broken into so there's always fresh glass on the ground i'm sure we'll see some and it doesn't get a lot of foot traffic people park here because it's still convenient to the clubs so you know we just try to uh, weave our way through as much as possible whenever we're on patrol here and there were a lot of clubs and a lot of like squabbles and stuff that would happen anytime the clubs closed at like 1 a.m we would go uh to uh belltown in downtown Seattle and that's an area where there's again a lot of clubs and there were a lot of drug dealers that would be like one block away from the clubs like all the clubs were on like either first or second Ave it's been a while since I've been down there and all the drug dealers were one block over and Phoenix would 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 identify them and go up and be like move along and that would every once in a while get like really tense because they would like not always take us seriously and Sometimes they were armed, but I, I, we never got shot at while I was there. But you, some of these guys were armed, and usually they, they would leave. And if they didn't, we'd call the police and then they'd leave. Whatever. I don't know how much of a difference that made, but at the time it felt like you were doing something. And there was Pioneer Square, which is sort of like um, also down on like a, the sort of waterfront area of uh, Seattle. And... That was an area that had a lot of homelessness and also a lot of violence. Like, um, there's video out there of one night that Phoenix is out patrolling and a, uh, and a woman gets shot in a drive-by a few blocks from where he is. And, and you can hear the gunshots 
in his patrol video and uh, they run towards who they think that the you know the guy was but just to be clear uh that drive-by was never solved no one was arrested for that is uh but some dramatic stuff would happen we would hear gunshots sometimes and we'd run towards it to see what we could do to help um, mostly it was breaking up fights it would be we'd do homeless handouts where we'd organize um ahead of time put together a lot of you know like clean socks and underwear food, all sorts of like food, hopefully like stuff without allergies. Um, and, and we just go out and um, give that stuff to people that were uh, homeless. Cause there is a lot of homelessness, just to be clear in um, Seattle, a lot of um, tent camps in downtown under bridges and stuff like that a lot. And um, sometimes they'd be asleep and you just leave it beside them. Hopefully they wake up and they find, you know, some water and some food and stuff and, and it helps. Um, what else did we do? We also did, um, we, well, like I say, so homeless handouts, breaking up fights, um, you know, with our patrols, every once in a while tracking down somebody that had stolen something or had been separated. Uh, a lot of photo ops. Phoenix got stopped a lot for photos and he would just pause the patrol to take those photos. Um, fine, you know. Uh, I've, I envisioned all of this just so you know, it's like, okay, why put on a superhero suit and everything? Well, I thought that it would become sort of a symbol. Um, it was getting publicity and news, and I thought, you know, maybe this will help fight apathy. Maybe this will make people proud to be from Seattle. Maybe it'll make them go like, hey, if those people are doing this sort of goofy thing, maybe the least I can do is uh, be quick to make a phone call if, if something's going wrong, or, or I'm going to be brave enough to step in. That's what I was thinking. We're trying to fight crime, but we're really trying to fight apathy by fighting crime. We're trying to be yeah. a symbol more than anything else. I, I, I eventually, over about a year, sort of came to feel that that was not actually happening, that it wasn't necessary. I'll get to that when I close out this whole thing. Um, and we would also do some promotional appearances. Um, there was a lot of going on the radio uh, or being interviewed by local news. Um, there was an ESPN documentary, um, and, and Phoenix usually brought me along for that, I think, because maybe I'm a, I'm at least an educated guy. I don't want to claim that I'm smart, but I'm an educated guy and I can speak well, right? So he would often bring me along and, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd hopefully, uh, provide a, a salient or coherent quote about what we were doing. A typical night on a patrol, we'll encounter uh, inebriated individuals that sometimes need help getting home. You good? You good? Yeah, we'll have you help. We'll have you come over. We now. administer you basic go. first aid for people that have fallen. We've encountered knives. We've encountered guns. The threats are real, and you have to be careful. Uh, and that was interesting. You know, you, you, you met some interesting people there. Um, it was it was interesting going into radio stations or having um, news crews interview you. Um, to me, that wasn't really the reason I went out and did it. And I started to feel like that was the reason many of the other people were doing it, was that they wanted the the attention and the recognition. I personally didn't care that much about attention because I felt like I was getting plenty of attention through things like I was podcasting and I was writing articles on, on blogs and stuff, and I felt like that was plenty of attention towards me, not like a secret identity. I felt like maybe I was going to be able to do some good. Maybe that was naive, but I really felt... I knew that we were doing some good. I knew we were. I, I, I helped find that, got that missing girlfriend, right? We were doing the homeless handouts sometimes. Phoenix didn't love doing those for the record, but he sometimes did. I liked organizing those. I felt like, you know, yeah, sometimes we'll come across trouble, but mostly we're, we're, we were definitely helping people in that regard. Um, that made me feel good that we were like, you know, helping out there. It's always been important to me to help the homeless. Um, they're, in, they're in a tough position. There's still people. I, I want to help them. Uh, so anyway, I'm getting off track. Um, that's some of the stuff I did. And I thought that we were going to like, you know, fight apathy. Let me talk about some of the actual stories, real quick. Uh, some of the some of the highlights, you'll you'll call it. I'll start with uh, a pretty big night. Uh, this one uh, was actually 
that guy that I, I grew not to really respect too much, Midnight Jack, called me up and was like, hey, um, you know, I've got a tip about like some bad acid being handed out downtown. Do you want to do a, a, a patrol, just the two of us? And I was just like, yeah, okay. Uh, that tip didn't really lead to anything, but we had a, we had a pretty big night. Um, we were walking through the glass alley area I talked about earlier, and I see a taxi cab just go right through a stop sign. We were like half a block away. It was like right ahead. It goes right through the stop sign. It hits four people that were crossing. I have no idea what the, the taxi cab guy was thinking. He had to be like looking down at a phone or the meter or something because he did not stop and he hit four people right in front of me. I saw it like, I want to say clear as day, but it was obviously a uh, night. Uh, but you know, I, I saw it and we ran up and three of them were kind of okay. They just sort of gotten clipped, but one lady had gotten hit really hard. Like, you know, one of them had to basically if four people were getting hit by, by uh, a taxi. And, you know, she'd hit her head hard on the ground and was bleeding a lot. But we always carried um, first aid supplies. I saw the taxi start to back up and I go, Jack, just stand behind that taxi. Do not let him leave. And I got out like the, the first aid kit we had, put on gloves and, um, you know, looked and, and just sort of like uh, applied some gauze, some pressure. And I, and I had him, I believe, I think I had Jack call the police. I, I could have, it, at this point, folks, just so you know, I'm talking about events that were seven to eight years ago. I should have made that clear, but it was seven to eight years ago. It was like 2014. Um, and the police, you know, showed up and uh, we kept the taxi cab guy there and he, he wanted to leave. It was really obvious that he just wanted to leave, but he, he didn't... Um, I was always okay taking my mask off when the police came to give statements and, and even talking to people. I didn't care too much about a secret identity so much as like trying to be a symbol. So I had taken off my mask. So the people weren't like scared, you know, I could like connect with them, see, see eye to eye and stuff. And um, that was a big one though. You know, like we got like um, the police, you know, like wrote up a report, took our statement. Um, I later had to testify in a court case against that guy. Um, but it was all like, um, I, I shouldn't say testify in court. It was, um, it was some sort of a deposition that I could do over the phone. So it may have been, um, like the evidentiary gathering phase. I, I'm not a hundred percent clear, but that was, you know, pretty important that I was giving a statement about this because that taxi driver was, man, he was in the wrong. And that wasn't all that happened that night. Then we met up with this guy uh, named uh, Ghost, and he was just sort of driving around, patrolling on his own, but he usually patrolled with us, and um, we're, we're going around, and we see another, a car just hit a parked car hard, like real hard, ripped off the back bumper of the other car, backed up and drove off, like a hit and run. And drove off, like, recklessly. Well, Ghost's car happened to be parked on that block, so we all jumped in. And, like, risky in, in retrospect, but we chased them. We chased them, and they knew they were being chased. But, like, we, we chased them, like, through the city a little bit. Um, until, like, uh, they got to their apartments. Uh, it was a pair of ladies. And one of them, the driver, was clearly intoxicated. And... Maybe a little freaked out that some guys in costumes just jumped out of the car and were just like, you know, like, you better wait right there. Uh, I know they were freaked out because she pulled a knife on me. <laughs> and I'll, I'll make it clear. We had very specific rules. We would not touch or hold restrained people like that. So I'm standing in front of her, like, go, like trying to de-escalate, going like, you need to, like, wait. Just wait. The police have been called. You need to just wait here. But I was also like walking backwards as she walked forwards. I was not going to touch her. I was really careful about something like that. Like if th somebody threw a punch or was threatening, that's one thing. She did pull out a knife, so maybe I would have been justified, to be honest. But that's like hindsight. You know, I was just like, okay, you know, if she takes a swing at me with the knife, that's one thing. But she hadn't yet. And, um, and the police got there and, and 
you know, I, I did not stop her from going into the apartment building, but we gave them a description. We pointed out the car that, and you know, that was, and that was all in one night. Um, but that was also something where I'm going like, well, look, we're always handing this off to the police. And I didn't love working with the police. They, 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 they treated us fine, to be honest, but like, I didn't love that. And, but at the same time, it was like, well, I can't, resolve any of these issues on my own, really. All I'm doing is being here to call the police at the right time. Maybe to administer medical help or de-escalate a situation, maybe. But it usually involved calling the police at a certain point. And I'm like, well, I don't have to be a guy in a costume to do that. I can just be out on the street and be sensible. I can de-escalate fights without a costume on. I can call the police without a costume on. So I started sort of losing a little bit of faith in it. Um, one of the goofiest days I remember ha having was uh, during one of those homeless handouts. I reached out to some other people. Just to be clear, <laughs> at one point there were like three superhero teams in Seattle that I was aware of. There was Phoenix's team. There was another one that I'm not remembering what their name was. And there was more of an outreach, like sort of homeless handout type thing, like exclusively, but they did wear costumes. So there were like three teams. It's ridiculous. But we tried sometimes to be friendly. Phoenix generally did not respect them. He did not like doing homeless handouts. He insisted on having people that could handle themselves in a fight. He was in most interested in breaking up fights. But in retrospect, it's not hard to find a fight if you hang outside of a club at 1 a.m. when it's being let out. These were like drunk people. Um, you generally could de-escalate things anyway. I, I, I got into some hairy situations, but in those de-escalating things of drunk people coming out of clubs, I never had to throw a punch, actually. It seemed like you, you would sometimes, but it never quite came there. Um, anyway, so one, one of these homeless handouts, I reach out to a guy from one of the other teams because he's well known for, I think, giving out socks or something. So I'm like, fine, I'll call this guy and invite him. It was like a, a show of goodwill. And the guy, I think, was called Skyman. Definitely not the kind of guy that could fight just because he was a large gentleman. And, uh, and as I... I don't know if he was mentally all there or maybe just not the smartest guy. He wasn't a bad person. I'm not saying anything bad about him, but he was sort of childish as we went out that night because while we're walking down the streets and handing out the food and stuff, and that's all good, there was like a street vendor selling these toy lightsaber type swords. And the guy bought one. It was like a, like a $3 light up sword and he was just playing with it and waving it around all night. And I found that so embarrassing. I really did. I was like, wow, you know, we're already sort of a bunch of weirdos walking around in our masks and, and armor and, and stuff. But to wave around a toy sword, that's, that's about a, that's a bridge too far for me. Uh, so I, uh, Nothing against the guy. I just did not want to invite him out again because I, I just found that embarrassing. That's all. Um, but that's fine. You know, no one was hurt. This all built up over several months until we were approaching something called May Day. And here in Seattle, every year, there is a, um, a peaceful march on May Day uh, for workers' rights. But... As part of that, um, there has become a, a, a darker element. There's sort of a block of anarchists and, uh, and racists, too, in the area that will sort of try to ruin the, uh, the march um, by sort of inserting themselves into it. Um, and, and this isn't speculation. Literally, some of the guys on the team had found Facebook groups where... And, and, and 
gotten into it, which in retrospect makes me question how they knew about that, honestly, like, I, because I do think some of the guys on the team were a little bit racist, so I think that's how they found out about these groups, but these groups would talk about, like, hey, these are our plans, we're going to meet here, and then we're going to, like, infiltrate ourselves into the, um, uh, march, and then we're going to, like, start, like, destroying property or something, we're going to try to, like, ruin it. It's like, wow, really? But I literally saw some of those Facebook groups and uh, discussions and stuff, so I was like, okay, this is a real thing. And the previous year, Phoenix had had a lot of success, basically, at May Day, because uh, some of these violent protesters started throwing bricks and rocks at a, um, at a federal building, and Phoenix and his team stood in front of it and defended it with, like, pepper spray and stuff like that. Um, and that made the news, and they felt, you know, and, and that is good, but... I also sort of would come to feel like protecting property, I don't really feel like that's my responsibility as a citizen. Um, like, I'd call if I saw something like that happening. But to insert myself between, like, a building and violence, I don't know if it's worth it. I definitely would for any person, any human being, or any animal. Um, property, eh, it's insured. It's, it's a shame if people do that. But I personally just didn't care that much. I'm like, whatever. It's, you know, some broken windows. I just don't... I'm, I don't know if I'm... I, I don't think I'm willing to punch a guy in the face to stop him from breaking a window. I, I just don't see... That was me. That was, that was just my take. But anyway, they'd had a lot of success, like, you know, getting on the news doing that last year. So they, they we did a lot of planning for, um, for May Day. And ultimately, those plans all got ignored. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought that our, our our work on that day ended up being very wasteful. I'll, I'll put it that way. I, I you know not like bad, but but very wasteful because we basically just we got started way too late. A bunch of people were too late to show up at the time we all agreed to, so that we could be towards like the front and in the middle of the uh, parade, and we were just chasing behind it. We were chasing behind it the whole way, just on foot, like walking, walking, walking. It's a long parade route, and we're all wearing, you know, body armor and stuff like that. And it's May. It was hot, and we're wearing a lot of armor, and we were all uh, getting tired. Now, somebody like Phoenix is doing much better, just to be clear. The guy's in really good shape. He's He's been a professional MMA fighter. And we all kept up, but it was... We were just hiking for, for most of that day. For most of that day. There were a few like skirmishes we sort of broke up, but we didn't we didn't encounter anything big, in my opinion, that day. Until I will admit the very end of my day. We had a rule where when we were done for the night, uh we'd always tried to park next to each other. And if we didn't, like we'd go in parties of two to like the cars and stuff. But in this particular case, um I guess I was parked somewhere, yeah, I was parked uh, uh, where we normally park, above this QFC uh, grocery store in Capitol Hill, um, but nobody else was there. So at a certain point, I did have to walk a few blocks by myself, and I actually was walking through Bla um, Glass Alley that I mentioned before. And this is, like, the one time I can think of where I where I did throw a punch. Um, there were... Um, there were people in... Um, just like sort of ski cloth, not ski masks, um, bandanas. And I was like, and that tended to be the people that were the anarchists and stuff, because almost nobody else would cover their face. And they saw me and they were like, you know, like, I can't remember the exact words because it's so many years ago, but they were like, you know, hey, what, what are you up to? Are you one of those uh, guys with Phoenix Jones? And they knew about him. And I was just like, yep, yep, that's me. And I was trying to ignore it and just walk to my car. And they stood in front of me. And, um, and it was clear that they wanted to start a fight. And, um, when it became clear that, like, we were about to, to fight, I, I punched him. I just, straight jab. Nothing, fa nothing fancy. Straight jab. Those are harder to see coming than, like, you know, throwing a big punch or something. Just a, straight at you. You don't, you don't, you can't always tell the timing. And the gloves I would wear had, like, lead line tackles. I punched that guy in the throat, and he dropped like a sack of potatoes. It was... Punching someone in a vulnerable spot is um, an uncomfortable thing, in my opinion. You have to commit to it, but um, 
I find it very uncomfortable to hurt somebody in that way. But I did it because it was it was literally I felt him or me. And I just punched one of the two guys and the other guy like sort of went to help his friend. I, you know, I, I didn't like break the guy's throat or anything weird like that. You know, I, I, I hit him in a vulnerable spot, but not full force. Like I say, a jab. And, uh, and I was just like, we done here? And they didn't really respond. And I just kept walking. So that was like, not the most exciting. Maybe that's a little anticlimactic for a punch, but, um, that was the one time I remember throwing a punch. There were plenty of times I thought we were going to be throwing punches, but at the last minute, the other side, you'd usually back down. And I didn't see anybody else, for the record, throw um, punches uh, in my whole time there. I, I really didn't. I saw us insert ourselves into some situations. Some shoving happened sometimes. No punches while I when I patrolled. So I will also say this. Sometimes you'll read some of the um, articles or see the news stories, and some real-life superheroes will tell their stories. I guess I can only speak to the guys that I hung out with. And they will tell some pretty wild stories. All I'll say is, uh, I think there's a lot of exaggerating going on there. Uh, are, is it like, you know, in the movie Kick-Ass or something? No, I, I would not call it that exciting. But is it nothing? No. Like, there's definitely some, some scuffling, and there's some drama, like, you know, chasing down people that have been violent. Mostly it's, you know, chasing down, like, a purse snatcher, like we've done that, or tracking somebody that's stolen something or interceding. I'll give you an example. Um, one night in the Cap Hill area, we um, see this very drunk woman sort of like like hanging onto like this one guy. And um, how do I say this? She, she was clearly trans and she walked by us and um, goes like, she goes like, help me. Like, she sort of whispered that, and, like, we, um, we sort of paused, and we, did we hear that right? Did, did you hear help me? Yes, that's what I heard, too. Okay. Turn around, go back, and we're like, hey, what's going on? And you need, uh, help? Thank you, Angel. Where's Angel? Sure, sure. And the guy's like, you don't need to worry about this. We're, we're, we're together. We're together. Don't don't worry. Leave us alone. And she's like, oh, you know, like she just want, all of a sudden wanted to talk to us and stuff. And like, he's like, we're going back to my place. And she's like, well, and it was clear she was just sort of so drunk. She was just sort of going along with whatever, but did not want to. And we just we just basically hung out and talked. We were sort of obnoxious by like, you know, even though he clearly wanted us to leave. Um, you know, we were cock blocking superheroes. But I, but she, she's like, thank you. I didn't really want to go home with that guy. I felt like, you know, he was kind of forcing me to. And we're like, okay, you know, if that's what was needed to help. Um, but there would also be like calls where I didn't really agree with them. Like, for instance, another time, there, this guy was clearly being abusive towards a woman, like, you know, yelling at her, screaming, raising fists. We run down from, like, you know, where we were to, like, catch up. And when he saw us approaching, he ripped off her purse and ran for it, right? Um, it was like a domestic squabble of some sort. We sort of chased him. We were fast enough, and we corner him. He'd, like, run into, like, a parking garage, but we, like, sort of corner him. But then, oh, these dum-dums, a couple of them pulled out their uh, stun guns and, and aimed them at him. And Phoenix was like, no, put it down. We don't need to do that. And Phoenix was mad at them after that because, like, you know, you drew a weapon on a guy that, like, really didn't need to because he wasn't threat. excuse me, threatening us. We just got, like, but we talked to him and he was, like, both... He agreed not to, like, you know, do anything else, but, like in exchange for us leaving him alone. And he gave us like the purse and the woman had caught up and we gave the purse back to her and she walked away and we made sure that she could, you know, leave without being hassled. But I was like, oh Jesus, I'm hanging out with guys that are, they're not pulling guns, but they're pulling tasers on people in a, in a really unnecessary situation. Like we were in no threat. Like he was literally, when, when we confronted him, he literally got down on the ground and cowered. 
Like he was on his butt with his knees clenched up and he was like, don't hit me, don't hit me. And then they pulled the taser. I was like, oh, I was like, oh my God, guys, please put that away. That is so unnecessary. Um, we also saw some stuff that was ugly that is hard to forget. There was one time doing a homeless handout and we went down into like, um, there are tunnels under Seattle. Seattle was literally at one point built one level up from an old town in a certain area. And some there's there's a couple small areas there where it's just some minor tunnels that some homeless people can sometimes sleep in. And one time we went in and the person didn't seem to be breathing. And, you know, we wouldn't always try to wake them up or anything like that. But this guy just wasn't moving. It was really cold. And, um, and he was dead. He was dead. And we called the police and they came and, and you know thanked us and took him but that was that was disturbing to see you know that stays with you um but you know this was uh i just would see more and more of stuff that i had trouble getting along with almost everybody on the team almost not everybody but i shouldn't even say almost maybe half the team actually had very different politics than i did and it was like, well, why am I hanging out with these people that, like, I wouldn't hang out with outside of the costume, you know? Like, I just didn't, I didn't like them. I felt like they'd have my back in a fight, but, and I don't want to throw the same people under the bus again and again, but, like, I would go to, like, this one guy's apartment to get ready, and he was always bragging about all these knives and guns that he had, and he always wanted to take them with us on patrol, and we'd all be like, no, you can't do that, no, no, no. And I'm like, this is a ticking bomb. You know, at some point, this guy's gonna, this guy's gonna do something. And I got a little disillusioned with our leader. I'm not gonna talk all sorts of bad stuff about Phoenix, because a lot of that stuff is now out in the news. But he had asked me to manage his social media at one point and gave me the login information for, for his stuff. And he would like send me a video and be like, can you format this and post it or something, something like that. But I'd go in there and I'd see the subject headers for all these things of like, you know, um, he was like always trying to hook up with, with women on Craigslist, but he was supposedly married. And I was seeing all these things saying like, do you want to do drugs tonight? While he was claiming to be straight edge. So when he got himself arrested, you know, last year, I think it was last year, maybe it was a little longer ago than that, for, for moving some drugs, I was kind of like disappointed, but not surprised. I don't think he's a bad person. I just don't think he's a very organized person, but I don't think he's a, I don't think he means to hurt people. I just don't think he's always thinking ahead. And I was like, well, I, you know, I'm going out and trusting these people to sort of like, you know, protect me as much as I'm protecting them. And uh, I, I just lost faith in slowly over like, you know, this being a good idea. Just seeing seeing the people behind like, oh, I don't want to go out with people that are bringing weapons. I'm tired of hearing people make like racist jokes and misogynist jokes. It didn't make sense to me. I'm like, we're a fairly diverse team. And yet like in smaller groups, they would like make jokes that like you would never make to, to everybody on the team. And I was like, I, I, didn't, I don't find that funny. There was, a, I'm not going to name names on this one, but like there was a person talking about how there was a female member on the team that was like bragging about how good she was at wrestling, like that you can't pin me, you can't pin me. And that person like says, and I that even if this is a joke, I didn't like it, says that he choked her out and then said that he stuck something in her and she was like well did you really and he's like well who knows and i'm like you can't do that to somebody that's that's horrific those are the people i want to stop like I, I if you did it i i can't know you and if you're joking about it i find that terrible i'm i'm and i'm trying to sanitize it for you folks um but there was funny stuff too that like sort of kept you in you know <laughs> We're, we're downtown, super late at night, and we're seeing um, things on the ground. CDs, and uh, air freshener, and the, like little like trinkets and, and things. And, and we're, we're like following a trail. Like every, every block there was one or two little things. And we're like, what, what is this doing? And we finally get to a car. It's had its window smashed out, and we're like, oh... 
oh, like somebody broke in and was like just walking down the street the, the, like the opposite way we've been going and dropping things along the way. And then we were like, wait a minute, we saw that super sketchy guy a minute ago that was carrying, He, we saw like this guy that was like, he looked like he was strung out, like super, super skinny, sunken eyes, dark eyes. He was carrying like, like a DVD player and something like a stereo. And he looked nervous as hell but we didn't put it together at the time. You know, we hadn't seen this line of trash in the smashed window. We're like, oh my God, that guy like broke into the, the car. I can't believe we missed that. Well, guess what? Later that night, we see that same guy and now he's got his arm full of coat hangers. And we'd seen that there was tons of clothes and coat hangers in that car that he broke into. That's probably why he broke into it. It looked like there was a lot of stuff in it. So we sort of like paused him there, called the police and we like, you know, handed it over. That was funny, seeing such a dumb criminal. <laughs> Who steals an armful of coat hangers? So you're doing stuff like that and you're like, well, that's kind of funny and it feels like, you know, we got like somebody uh, who broke into a car and got him arrested, whatever. At some point along the way, you know, I was not exercising the same way. I was putting on some weight. I changed my costume. Who cares? Um... You know, I was in like an ESPN documentary and they they shot me from an unflattering angle. I, I definitely don't think I looked that bad, but they got me at a low angle at a time when I hadn't full, like strapped my suit up properly. It was like out wide and it looked really bad. They share Fodor's passion for justice, even if they don't share his MMA workout regimen. Now I'm starting to feel like, well, I look like more of a goofball. I'm losing faith in the crew. And I think the straw that broke the camel's back was um, going out one night with another camera crew. And it was for uh, this British uh, uh, show. Uh, there's a guy called Carl Pilkington that would like sort of travel around the world and do things. And so they sent a camera crew out to patrol with us to get a sense of what we did to see if it was worth then flying Carl out to do an episode of him being a real life superhero. And it became obvious that they thought that we were going to be goofballs. They wanted something kind of silly. And you can see that in an episode that Carl Pilkington eventually did where he's just sort of like, you know, more of a goofy superhero. Um, and instead, you know, we were inserting ourselves into brawls and stuff. <laughs> Break it up! And there was like two huge groups of people that were like about to come to blows outside of a club and we like four of us like ran into the middle and broke it up. But I was like, well, you know, the, the news is like viewing us as a, as a goof. Like they, they clearly wanted it. They clearly thought that we did not do stuff like this. They, 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 that wasn't what they were interested in because that's how they viewed us. And I'm viewing some of my team members as like kind of dangerous or at least reckless. Uh, maybe some of them not the brightest. Some of them I did, did like, just to be clear. Um, and I just, I was like, you know what? I feel like I could start doing the same stuff that I'm doing without the costume. I don't need, you know, I can just, if I see somebody in trouble, I'm, I'm already gonna insert myself. I can, I can help the homeless with, you know, handouts all the time on my own, and I still do. And I can donate money to those causes. And I think that that makes a difference. So, about a year in, I, um, I just sort of walked away from it all. And it didn't hurt that honestly, at that point, uh, the team leader, Phoenix, had, he was pretty disorganized at the time. He had supposedly, after May Day, he was really disappointed in the team's performance that day. I think mostly disappointed because we didn't really see any action that day. And he cut a bunch of members of the team. He said that it was disbanded, but we actually, like some of us kept patrolling. It was really just an excuse, I think, for him to get rid of the people that he didn't like. And um, so ever since May, like, you know, like the next several months, he was just a little less invested. And he was the guy that like brought everyone together and got the publicity. I'm not the famous guy. Nobody knows who Omega is. <laughs> you know now if you've watched this far, but nobody knew who I was and that was okay. 
a lot of people know who Phoenix Jones is still. Um, and I think he still goes out every once in a while. I'm not in touch with him as much anymore. Um, I did have him on an early episode of Comic Tropes. That was really before he got himself in any trouble. Um, once he got in trouble, I, I didn't really have a whole lot of interest in, in reaching out. And uh, yeah, uh, I, it, all it meant was I was like, yeah, I think I made the right decision walking away. Uh, so maybe, maybe it was a bad idea. I do feel like I still did some good. I do. That first night, I helped the guys, a guy get reunited with his lost girlfriend. And I, there were so many people out that night, you know, I guess the police probably would have eventually found a way to reunite them, but not easily. W what were they going to do? Like, she didn't speak English. They were going to just take her to a precinct and hope that, like, the boyfriend eventually checked there? I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, uh, I felt good about some of the stuff that we did, but ultimately, uh, I, I walked away from it when I started to feel like I could just be a good person on my own. I didn't need a superhero suit for it. But hopefully some of this has been interesting to you. Um, I'm, I haven't gone into full detail. If it's, if it's really interesting and this video gets a lot of traction, and I don't necessarily think it will, but if it does, that might be something I'd make like a single issue of at some point. My superhero year. You know, Harvey Picar had my cancer year, or our cancer year, and he had like, you know, our movie year. I would have like my superhero year and I could go into like more detail about what I what I personally witnessed and went through. Um, but I just wanted to share a unique story with you. Next week we will be back with uh, a new episode of a formal episode of Comic Tropes that deep dives into a fantastic super super duper <laughs> super duper uh, artist. I think everyone will be very excited about that. And just so you know, I do have my second channel, Pros and Cons, and I do a weekly live stream there where I review the comics that I've read that week, draw something, take questions from the audience, and talk about the comic book news of the week. So that's on Pros and Cons, Mondays, 5 p.m. Pacific. I always do a live show. Uh, that's been growing. It's really exciting. I also do things like travel vlogs and stuff on that channel. Not a lot, but some. So please check that out. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be back next week with an actual Comic Tropes episode. And until then, keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.